marveling at the ability of this rural man ending up in all these boards. This dropout ending up a qualified lawyer and a practicing attorney with a string of qualifications. B. Uris, LLB, higher diploma in company law, higher diploma in tax law, BA honors, Bachelor of Commerce, honors of the same degree and Master of Commerce. How did he do all of these, having dropped out when he was so young in order to help his siblings? Now, the number, just the number of nationally significant economic projects in which he was involved are too many to list. For our first democratic government, Negota was clearly one of the go-to persons. And the transformation and the repurposing of particularly our transport sector is something in which he played a key role. And when the government needed a cool head and some skilled hands, Negota was always at hand to say, Tumamina long before Tumamina became fashionable. <laughs> the spirit of George Negota hovers over both our private and public sectors. The name of George Negota pops up again and again. And yet, he still made time for family and time to establish his own companies and his own businesses doing all these with probity, elegance, and balance. So what are the salient lessons we can learn from George Nagota about leadership? The first is that leadership matters. 20 years after his country gained its independence, Chinua Achebe, the late Nigerian writer, noticed that Wherever he went in Lagos, in the drinking halls, at bus stops, at pubs and nightclubs, Nigerians were speaking and they always began their conversations with the phrase, the trouble with Nigeria is. What frustrated Achebe was not merely that people held divergent opinions as to what the trouble with Nigeria was. What hurt him was how it seemed that people were too scared to say what they think and to think what they say. They didn't say what they think and they didn't think before they said what they said. Everywhere he went, he found that people were mealy-mouthed and fearful. So he sat down and penned an angry little book with the simple but most familiar title in Lagos. The title of that book was The Travel with Nigeria. It was published in 1984. That little book starts with the elephant in the room and stays only with the elephant in the room up to the end. The very first paragraph in that booklet goes like this, and I quote, the trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely a failure of leadership. There is nothing wrong with the Nigerian character. There is nothing wrong with the Nigerian land or climate or water or air or anything else. The Nigerian problem is the unwillingness or inability of its leaders to rise to the responsibility to the challenge of personal example, which is the hallmark of true leadership, end of quote. We could be talking about contemporary South Africa. The trouble with South Africa is simply and squarely a failure of leadership. All of our problems can be summarized under this subheading of a failure of leadership. A country is in trouble when people who want and can't lead proceed to occupy leadership positions. Leadership is about the constant generation of fresh ideas. 
if leaders are not able to generate fresh ideas, they are not leading. They shouldn't be there. Because you can only lead with ideas. And those ideas must be fresh and different. Leadership is about the firing up of imagination that is sometimes born out of anger and dissatisfaction about the present and sometimes about the past circumstances. Leadership is about the transformation of that dissatisfaction into concrete goals. It is about the charting of a course towards the achievement of those goals and the pursuit of those goals with determination, always with a view to the future and to the next generation. Let me quickly add that when I talk about leadership and leaders, I'm not talking about individuals only. I'm talking about the BMF as leader. I'm talking about Old Mutual as leader. I'm I'm talking about your local congregation as leader. The second takeaway from the George Negota is that knowledge matters. I find it remarkable that when Negota met his untimely death in 2017, in his mid-60s, he was registered for a doctorate. Imagine what ideas he might have generated given his intimate and practical knowledge of policy development. You will see that he was a multidisciplinary thinker. He was a lawyer, but he was also an economist and quite at home with the accounting sciences too. So here was a businessman who believed it was important to have knowledge. Here was a lawyer who believed it was not enough just to know the law. What makes Negota an educated man is that he knew that he did not know everything. You are only educated when every time you get a qualification you realize how little you know, how much more there is to know. The third takeaway from his life is that ethics matter. And let me start with a very long quote about his character from his friend and colleague for many years, Ruel Koza. George was a man of great character, defined by honesty, elegance, simplicity, and good taste. As a matter of stance, George said much in a few words, selected among his thoughts carefully, orderly arranged what he said and he spoke with composure. Probity characterized George in that he behaved in a manner that was essentially beyond reproach. He could have very well chosen to abuse his standing and access political largesse for ill-begotten self-enrichment. He instead stood for sheer grit, diligence, personal discipline, and dedication to national stewardship. He realized his life ambition, not a whiff of scandal." End of quote. Almost all the major problems in the world today, including poverty, violence, and climate change, can be traced back to the lack of ethical intelligence among leaders, but also the lack of ethical intelligence in our policies. The fourth takeaway is that imagination matters. Let me describe this one this way. So in March this year, the London-based Nigerian writer Ben Okri uh, published his book called uh, The Freedom Artist. In that book, Ben Okri takes the reader into a dystopian world which feels familiar and strange, which feels far and near, which feels likely and unlikely. It also feels believable, but also unbelievable, all at once. Now, imagine a world of splendor, 
but that world is also a giant prison. It's a little bit like imagining South Africa as a psychiatric hospital, the whole country. <laughs> Life as in Dimeni, from Messina to Cape Town. This is the kind of painting that Ben Okri produces in this book. In that country, citizens are forbidden from talking about a prison or talking about the, the mental asylum. They are not allowed to talk about it. So you live in a prison, but you are told never mention it. You live in a mental asylum, you are told never talk about it. Because if you talk about it, you might get ideas about freedom. So it is banned. You are not allowed to talk about it. Imagine a world in which the rich minority live large while the poor majority suffer. But here's the thing. In this world, books, language, art, myths, thinking, and asking questions are also strictly forbidden. So there's even a group of people called the question askers. So when the police come, they say, have you seen any question asker today? So anyone who asks questions gets arrested and many of them never return from prison. It is a world ruled by a faceless hierarchy who have a police force. The police force are cannibals. They eat the people themselves. <laughs> and so in that country, you meet a lot of people. Some don't have ears. Others have half a nose. Others have got uh, the upper lip is gone because the police ate them. And guess who helps the police to eat the people? It is the rich and their children. But in that world, there's also a tiny minority of people who gallantly resist all of these things. The whole society has even forgotten how to write. They have even forgotten how to speak because for such a long time, they were not allowed to speak. But a tiny minority of people are trying to keep these arts. There's a family that looks after books and hides them. And there are others who are trying to make sure that questions continue to be asked, that thinking continues, even though it is banned. Now, after reading Ben Okri's book, one cannot help the feeling that there are several ways in which our country is becoming like that world. Think about it. Is it normal what men are doing to women in this country? It's cannibalistic. It's out of control. They don't care whether it's 16 days or it is Women's Day. They just go on and carry on. And maybe our country is a prison. Our country is a mental asylum. I want to conclude with a quotation from uh, Achebe again. He writes an essay about uh, leadership, and, and in the middle of that essay, he says, and I quote him, leadership is a sacred trust. No one gets into it lightly or unadvisedly because it demands qualities of mind and discipline of body and will far beyond the need of the ordinary citizens. Anybody who offers himself, continues Achebe, or herself, or is offered to society for leadership, must be aware of the unusually high demands of the role and should, if in any doubt whatsoever, firmly refuse the prompting. So if you are not sure, you have what it takes in terms of self-control, in terms of uh, be giving a personal example. Achebe says you should refrain. George Negota was one such leader. And we are very lucky that our lives have overlapped with his. And we are very lucky that our organization, the BMF, can count him amongst its leaders. Thank you very much.